Well, um, so we are the CMC. Brittany will explain a little bit about the partnership, but I just wanted to introduce our speaker for the night. We're going to be talking about um, trip prepping your next adventure, um, trip planning your next adventure. Um, we're kind of gearing up for this really fun summer season, so we're really excited to kind of present this to you. Um, it's a good review if you already have some skills, and it's also good for your brand. Your brand. Um, I'm getting a little bit of that. As am I. Yeah, if everybody can go on mute, if they're not talking, we'll just uh, stay on mute. If you have questions, you can use chat function, raise your hand, or just speak up at the time. Uh, just be aware that multiple people may be speaking at the same time, so if you can be patient with everybody. But until you're speaking, if you can go on mute, it would be helpful. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so like I said, uh, Mike O'Connor will be presenting the first part of this uh, this lecture tonight, um, this fun seminar. He is a longtime member of the CMC, um, four years, but that's long time in my head. Um, he has been a scout master longer than he can admit, um, and he is a senior instructor for our Wilderness Trekking School, um, a really great program that even some people on this call have done. It's incredible, a great uh, starter school, and definitely a great feeding point from this specific seminar. It teaches you all about the different skills Additionally, he actually just created this really great initiative called Day Hiker School, which will be an online version of Wilderness Trekking School. So it's going to be really great. And he's going to talk about that a little bit kind of towards the end of his talk. But uh, definitely something you guys should look out for, especially in this kind of turbulent time where we are all virtual. Um, and uh, he's also an adjunct professor at Regis. So he's definitely know he knows what he's talking about. He's awesome. Um, and I'm very fortunate to get to announce him tonight. Um, so, like Ben said, if you guys have questions, you can use the chat box or speak up. Um, we want this to be your experience, so be interactive um, and enjoy it mo most you can. Um, and then I'll hand it over. Brittany, you want to talk now or at the end? I can just do a quick chat uh, real fast. So, hey, everyone. My name is Brittany Smith. I'm the marketing director at the Colorado Mountain Club. It's nice to see you all. I'm super excited about this partnership. When Dylan and I got together and then she worked magic and made this happen, um, I was super psyched. Y'all are just down the road from us. We're in Golden as well. Um, and so it's nice to um, have some local people about. So basically, for those of you that don't know, just real quick, the Colorado Mountain Club's been around since 1912. And the whole point is to get people outside safely and responsibly. So with outdoor skills, helping you learn navigation, what to bring. Um, we have courses from intro to hiking safety all the way up to high altitude mountaineering, ice climbing, rock, uh, rock climbing. So anything that you're looking to you know, gain more skills, maybe go back and go over some of your skills since we all haven't been outside climbing in some time, um, we've got courses to cover that. Um, and then we also have gear discounts as well. You get up to 70% off some of the best gear in the industry with Expert Voice and a couple other things. So we know sometimes that can be the biggest barrier to getting outdoors is how expensive climbing can be with, I need another what? Like, <laughs> what do I need? So um, we try to help make that possible. And then we also do a bunch of get-togethers. So the thing's opening up. Now we're doing uh, more small group activities. And so, you know, we're doing this virtually because that's, you know, what we live in right now. But things are going to start slowly opening up and hopefully we actually get to meet you all in person soon. So um, okay. I'll go ahead and in the chat box, I'll put the link to the NREL um, codes and you guys get 20% off your membership. So um, and that extends to your family as well. So there are codes for you to share with your spouses or domestic partners or whatever. And um, yeah, take take uh, take advantage of that. Like I said, 20% off and you get access to all those gear discounts, access to all of our trips and then discounts on all the classes that I mentioned. So um, anyways, that's enough of a sales pitch. That's not what this is about. <laughs> so you guys go ahead and enjoy. And without further ado, I'll go ahead and pass this over to Mike. So enjoy and I'll be monitoring the chat. So let me know if you have any questions. Okay. Thank you. I'll try to live up to that um, great in introduction. <laughs> um, I would add to Brittany's talk, for me, the Colorado Mountain Club has been one about a lot of instruction. I don't know how many class different schools I've taken, but it's a lot. Um, and I've learned a lot. But for me, the probably the greatest benefit of being a member of the Colorado Mountain Club has been the friendships that I've made and the how quickly they have become what will, I assume, lifelong friends and uh, people I hike with, people I travel with, people I do a lot of things with. So I would um, encourage any of you who have an interest in going outdoors to do um, to join and to participate. 
Um, with that said, I'll get started. Uh, the presentation I give, I'm giving tonight will be a very quick overview of some things that we cover in Wilderness Trekking School and Day Hiker School. It's sort of a, pr a primer for that type, for those two those two schools. Um, so we start off and just say welcome to CMC over hiking overview. Um, let's see if I can figure. Out. This is a this is a hike I went on when I left as a trip leader. We went up and just took a and we're hiking. It's Upper Crater Lake. Um, Mike, if you're sharing, I'm not sure everybody can see it just yet. All right, let me see what I can do. Maybe I forgot something here. Oh, there we go. I got to hit the share button, I guess. <laughs> now, can you see it? Nope. <laughs> Not quite. Sometimes it takes a hot second for it to move over. There Thank it you. is. All right. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Good. Sorry about that. Um, so, welcome to my little presentation here. I won't, tr I'll try not to read. I hate when people read PowerPoint presentations. So, this is a lake that we hiked up to couple summers ago this is for me the reason why i put this here this is the reason i get out is spectacular views with that i get to share with friends um, for me this class and the classes we we teach are about preparation to set yourself up for success when you get out in the wood out in the woods and john wooden is one of my favorite um coaches and this my my children hate this saying because I say it so often. But failing to prepare is preparing preparing to fail. Um, I think that's the concept behind what we're trying to teach here. Um, as as you can see, if you if you overpack your pack, you will find that it's painful to carry that much weight. So I think figuring out what you want and trying to make things that go into your pack have multiple purposes is a um, smart way to go. What should you pack in a, what should you pack for just doing a day hiking trip? There are a few things that I think that are really important. The first and foremost are shoes. I think you need to have shoes that are comfortable, will provide good support, there's nothing worse than being on a hike and having your feet hurt. So I think it's a good idea to make sure that you, that's probably one place you want to spend a little money and get good equipment. I hike with hiking poles. You don't have to, you don't have to happen, but they do make things a lot easier to do. The clothing that you buy, you shouldn't use cotton. It'll tend to get wet and stay wet. Um, we use, we often recommend wicking fabrics. There's um, artificial fabrics. One that's often recommended is um, merino wool. The other piece of equipment I recommend that you put a little bit of time and energy into buying is your pack. You need to make sure it fits you, that you have a properly fit. That, uh, I think it's absolutely vital to have a good waist belt you should be carrying something like 80 to 90 percent of the weight on the belt, not in your shoulders. It'll help you to be able to go longer and have a much more enjoyable day. If you've been around hiking, and I assume some of you have, there's always a, there's about 100 different versions of what goes into what's called the 10 essentials. I broke it down into into hydration, nutrition, clothing, navigation, fire starting, first aid, and uh, you can read the rest of the list. I'm going to go through each one of these things. That'll be the bulk of what the rest of this talk is about. Um, since we're going to be talking about hydration, I thought I would show you a picture of a hike I just did a couple days ago. Um, the river was running fairly strong because of all the spring runoff. And you can see the snow still on top of the mountains in the background. 
hydration. Really what that means is water. And the thing about water is it will absolutely be the heaviest thing that's in your pack. So you need to make sure you have enough so that you don't run out during your hike, but you want to be, you don't want to carry a lot of extra because a gallon of water weighs about eight pounds. So you want to make sure that you, you know, carrying around an extra couple, three pounds all day long can be problematic. Uh, but on the other side, a much bigger problem is running out of water. So it's a risk reward kind of thing that you got to look at. One of the ways I get around that is I always carry filtration systems with me. And if I've looked on my maps and seen that I'll have water as I'm going along, I'll often carry maybe a little less water and refill my bottles as I go. Uh, there are uh, there are many different ways to uh, to filter water, and it's beyond the scope of what we're talking about here. But it's something if you take uh, backpacking school, or you take wilderness trekking school, or you take some of the other schools within CMC, they spend a lot of time on water filtration. Some of the basic things you want to look at for um, buying a system is how easy it is to use, how reliable it is, how much does the system weigh? There's some great systems out there that are fairly heavy. You probably don't want to carry those. Um, how long does it take to filter? There's like gravity filters that can take 45 minutes. Great for backpacking because they filter a lot of water. Not so great for day hiking. So, um, and probably I think the single most important thing is to look at what is it that the system's removing. Some won't take out some of the viral contaminants, some will. You just want to spend some time talking to people and researching what you're buying. Um, the other thing is to take a look at how are you going to store water as you go down the trail? A lot of people use the, the plastic Nalgene bottles. They work really well. Um, not so great in the winter for keeping things warm, but they they tend to be lightweight and fairly durable. I know a lot of people use bladders. They work well. Not my favorite because you have no way of knowing how much water you have as you go through the day. And it's easy to drink too much and find yourself without water. Hard to fill on a trail even using most filtration systems. So. Hydroflax are, hydro are great, but they tend to get beat up pretty bad on rocks and things as you're hiking. So. I mean, then there's, you can use just a regular water bottle you buy at the um, local grocery store or at your local filling station. I've done that many times. They're very light, they're very good. Um, they work fine and they're very inexpensive. The other thing you want to take a look at is nutrition. Nutrition is what you eat. I, I look at nutrition as being something beyond just what you eat. It's how you take care of your body as well. And from my point of view, this starts the day before you hike, making sure. I can't tell you how many times I've been on a trail and I come across somebody curled up in the middle of the trail because they were out partying the night before and they suddenly ran out of gas because of the hangover from the night before. Probably not the best choice, but it happens. For me, I try to get a good night's sleep the day before I hike. I try to make sure I eat some proteins in the evening and get some good carbohydrates on in the morning. And again, one of the places I learned a lot about nutrition was in the backpacking school. Next question is, what should you pack in your pack? I think it's important to pack whatever meals you think you're going to eat, but it's also important to take extras. I will often take energy bars and trail mix and uh, stuff just to have extra food for myself and for other people. I, I, it's, not, it's not uncommon to run across people on the trail who have lost their energy and don't have enough food with them. 
and being able to share and help them is not a bad thing. Clothing considerations. Uh, the single most important thing I can say here is layer up. Uh, you need to have multiple layers available. Sometimes we start at lower altitudes in our hiking and it may be fairly warm. So you'll start with just maybe a pair of pants and a short sleeve shirt. But if you're climbing, let's say a 14er, as you go up, you'll find that the temperatures will cool and having a poofy, almost down coat becomes a necessity because of the winds and the other things. It can get cold even in July or August. I've been in the mountains backpacking and been, and been snowed on 12, 14 inches in the middle of July. The other thing to remember about clothing is that weather can be very unpredictable and can change fast. So having multiple layers is, is important so that you can, uh, if a, a good cold wind comes in, you can protect yourself. Sun protection is important as you're doing this. Hat, having a hat, a lightweight, lightweight pants and things. Um, I tend to wear long sleeve shirts and long pants when I hike just to protect myself from the sun. So, and I wear a big broad brim, brimmed hat that goes all the way around. Sunglasses are important so that you don't get, especially when there's snow, so that you don't get sun, blind, sun blindness. Uh, and again, no cotton. This is a hike I did going from the top of Loveland Pass up over to the top of Eisenhower Tunnel in late May. Um, and as you can see, uh, as we got about halfway through the day off in the cloud, off in the distance, clouds came in and we had to bail out and had to actually um, go through Loveland ski area to get down. One thing you'll find in the mountains is you're on the east side of a mountain and the storm will come in from the west and suddenly pop up over the top of the hill and you didn't know it was there. So having the ability to weather that with things like um, rain gear and wind gear is very important. Here's extra clothing I tend to put in my own pack. I'll put in rain gear just so in case I get caught in rain or hail. I'll put in wind gear. Usually the wind gear and the rain gear are the same thing. One thing I have found absolutely vital is to have an extra base layer, meaning like a lightweight shirt and a maybe a long, pair, lightweight pair of long underwear and socks with me. It may sound funny in the summer, but there's been a few times I've fallen into water or got had to walk through water and I need to change into something dry. So it's nice to have an extra set of clothes. I will carry a pair of mock of um, flip flops to cross water streams or that kind of thing. It's good to have something to be able to take your shoes off so that you can keep your shoes dry when you have to wade your way through a stream. So. The other thing that's important, and it's way beyond the scope of what we're doing here, but that's navigation. But the thing I would cover here is that for me, I, I'm going on a hike tomorrow. I started navigating that hike a couple days ago. I started looking at maps, where I'm going, what kind of conditions I expect, started reading what kind of weather conditions I might run into. I think it's important to, that way it, it helps me pack my pack and to be prepared for what I think I'm going to do. It also helps to know to know where you're going and what and to mark out the things you expect to see on a map. There's a lot of different uh, software that you can use or apps on your phone that you can use to do this. The one thing I think a lot of people don't realize is that most of the, in talking to search and rescue people, most of the hikers that they go out and rescue were people that were on trails and just got lost, took a wrong turn someplace. They're not people hiking off trail. The, the vast majority of people who are rescued are those, are people who are hiking on trails. So it's important to have a map of what you're going on and to be able to read the map. 
one of the most important things to do is when you get to a trailhead, find them, look around and find a map if it's there. When you're parking in the morning, one, make sure you're at the right trailhead. And two, just to get a feel for um, what to look, make sure your map corresponds with what the trailhead map shows. Some other issues to take a look at are uh, there are a lot of apps now that will run on your phone or that you can run on your own personal computer. One of my personal favorites is All Trails, but there are a lot of them out there at this point. Some of the ones I, I use all of these at some point in time, and that's All Trails, Cal Topa, Gaia, and Hiking Project. If you're going to hike on some trails, individual trails will actually have an app of their own. Colorado, the Colorado Trail has that, and there's a app called 14er.com that has maps and routes for all the different 14ers and several of the 13,000 foot peaks in Colorado. One of the activities I enjoy is winter camping, but it can be cold, and fire is one of my great friends in winter camping. One of the things we recommend that you bring along is some kind of fire starter. For the most part, you probably won't use this, especially in the mountains in Colorado these days, because it seems like we're always under some sort of fire watch. But if you find yourself in a situation where you're lost or you need to be able to stay warm and you're going to spend a night when you hadn't planned to, sometimes a fire can be a good thing. The important things about starting fires is that one, you know how to do it, and two, that you know how to put it out properly. You don't want to be the guy that started the latest forest fire. Uh, so it's really important to learn the skills around campfires and how to do it. It's very important if you're going to take fire starter with it to practice with what you take and be able to use it quickly and safely. Most of the times when you're going to need a fire is probably when you are getting close to hypothermic and your hands are going to be shaking. So starting fires isn't going to be easy. You need to know what you're doing to be able to do it well and fast. If you happen to get lost and you aren't super great at navigating, the rule is once you figure out you're lost, stay, stay put, find a place that you can set up camp and stay put and hopefully what you've done ahead of time which was something i always recommend that people do is that you have a friend that's back in town you tell them where you're going usually i always provide will email over a map of the trail i intend to do um, and i tell them like tomorrow i'm going hiking well, I'll tell the people my emergency contact that, that uh, if I'm if you don't hear me by hear from me by noon Friday, please start calling search and rescue. And I give them that phone number. So it's important to be able to. You don't want to be the guy who ha had to cut his arm off and then spend 101 hours agonizing about what he's going to do. I think we've all seen or heard the story. Um, I do, signaling is another very important thing you want to do and you want again it's something you practice you want to make sure that you put things if you are lost that you put out a message to people who are trying to find you putting out something bright in an open meadow putting out um, lighting fires blowing whistles uh, they're all ways to communicate uh, the biggest thing when you find yourself in a situation like this is to manage your attitude. Your attitude is the thing that will get you through any any problems that you run into. You need to keep calm, center yourself, take a few minutes and just take a deep breath, figure out what's going on and try to keep a positive attitude. When I was a scoutmaster, one of the things we taught all the Boy Scouts was something called the rules of three. And it's just a simple rule set of rules that let them know what are your priorities if you find yourself in a situation in a lost situation or a situation where you've got to find a way to survive. 
and they go like this. You can live three minutes without air. You can live three hours without shelter. You can live three days without water, three weeks without food, but you can live for a very long time. We put in three months to keep the three going if you maintain the proper attitude and use the skills that you learn. If you don't have the proper attitude, you're going to, none of this is going to work. In studying a lot of the problems where people, in a lot of situations where people have run out of, run into problems in the outdoors, it's never, it's almost never a single big mistake that gets them in trouble. It's a series of small mistakes where they find themselves in a bad situation and then they panic and then they start making more decisions that if they had taken a few moments and gotten them calm, themselves calm, they would never have done. It's just a series of small errors that compound into one big ones. And most of the great, the tragedies that happen in the mountains can be related back to this. First aid. The, the CMC teach, teaches a whole class just on nothing but wilderness first aid, and then you have all kinds of organizations if you want to learn more about it. Um, it's a great, it's, it's, it's a great thing to be able to do. One of the most important things I think any of us can do is just take, and the CMC actually has a form that you can fill out that does this, but you don't have to use that form. You just take a simple piece. What I tell my students in WTS is take a piece of paper, write your name on it, your address, your telephone number, who your emergency contacts are, any medical issues you have, are you diabetic, do you have a heart condition, whatever that might be, a list of all the medications you take, how often, and what that looks like, and any other information that a doctor might need if you were found unconscious, whether that's on a city street or whether that's in the woods. And then I tell people to take and laminate that and put it in their pack. Um, create that list, laminate it so that it doesn't get ruined uh, if because it's just a simple piece of paper. And I always put it actually in my first aid kit. You'll find within the CMC, every instructor and every trip leader is um, taught to go to your first aid kit first and look for this. Some other simple things you probably want are you always want sunscreen for sun protection. If you go to where the places I like to go where there's water and there's lots of wildflowers and those kinds of things, there's something that always goes with it. It's those little pesky critters called mosquitoes or ticks or things. So you want to have a bug lotion or a bug repellent of some kind. Um, I always t I take some medicines for a couple things. And I always have a couple days worth of medicines in the little in my little kit, just so in case something I have them in case I need them. And any other kind of over the over counter things that you think you might need, a Benadryl or a whatever, um, those are kind of a personal choice. One of the other things that's important to make sure you have patches or tape or whatever you system you want to use in case you do get blisters on your feet. They do happen from time to time, especially if you hike a, some distance. And so it's good to be able to treat those things. Uh, some other basics you might want to have are some various size bandages in case you cut yourself, um, a little bit of antiseptic cream, and some analgesics if you find that you're in pain. Some other things, let's see. As for first aid kits, there are a million of them commercially available. I haven't found in one, personally found one that I specifically really am in love with, but a lot of them are very adequate. I would guess if I was on a trip with 10 people and we all pulled out our first aid kit, everybody would have something different. It's, there's a lot of personal, it says something about your le risk level and things based on what you take in your first aid kit. Also, it says something about your training. Um, 
one of the very basic rules I always tell my students on first aid kits, there's no reason to carry a bunch of stuff that you don't know how to use. And that's just extra extra weight that you're carrying that really has no value. So it's based on your own level of training and your own comfort. Take those things that you know how to use. And if you think that you could um, appropriately use them to treat somebody. One of the things I always hate about giving these talks is it always seems like what we're doing is talking about the worst things, the disasters, and we never really talk about the fun things and the and the joys. This is a this is an Arapaho Pass out of the Eastern Portal, and it's that area has been an area I've done a lot of hiking around. Um, it's it's really fun to go from there and actually hike over on to, into Winter Park. So. Um, One of the questions that we often have that um, often comes up is, what do you do if you have to go to the bathroom? Well, if you hike long enough, it will happen. So, bio breaks. Um, again, there are many different ways to do it. The basics are you should go off trail by 100 feet at least um, when you're deciding to defecate. Um, you dig a cat hole that's at least six to eight inches deep and wide enough to contain whatever you're going to do. Um, in some of the more tender or more fragile ecosystems, you'll find that you're actually required to pack this stuff out. But I'll leave that discussion to backpacking school. Um, so you will, to, do, to be able to do this properly, you're going to need some sort of fairly stout shovels, shovel implement. You, you use that to dig your hole. Um, you, you spread the dirt out around it. And then what you, then you do your business. And one of the things you want, and it sounds silly, but we as Westerners are not used to squatting and going to the bathroom. So you want to be careful that you don't get anything on your pants or on your on your clothing. It it does happen, and there I have heard several stories that are very funny to listen to, but not so fun to live live through. Um, toilet paper can be packed out or buried in the cat hole. Um, Inevitably, when you when this happens, there will be some materials, especially the toilet paper or anything, that don't quite make it into the cat hole when you're done. So you do not want to use your shovel because remember, you got to put that thing back in your pack. Um, not a great thing to have to carry around all day. So what I always recommend is just find a stick and kind of push everything down into the hole and then cover everything up. And then, and then you want to make sure you keep your shovel clean so that you can put it in your backpack. For the ladies, um, gentlemen have this is one place where gentlemen have a distinct advantage when they're when they're urinating is they can simply just do their business. For the ladies, you want to make sure that um, any TP you use, I I always recommend that you should be. Um, packing out that TP. For that purpose, I would say carry a somewhat larger Ziploc bag. Some people will say to dig a cat hole and bury it, but I think I've found enough TP in the woods that I think it's important to start bringing this stuff out. What are the rules about where you decide to go to the bathroom? Um, Again, leave the trail by 100 feet, um, maybe even 200. A lot of times you're going that far just to, just to get behind some cover so that you're not exposing everything to, to all the people you're hiking with. Uh, make sure you're, when you do choose a place, you're staying away from anthills and other unpleasant insects. That can be um, a little bit painful. 
the other very important thing is to stay at least 200 feet away from water sources, streams, creeks, marshes, bogs. Uh, it keeps the water from being infected with human bacteria and human uh, waste. If you find yourself above tree line and there aren't trees to go hide behind, if you do carry a tarp of some kind and you have a couple friends with you, you can have them help you um, build a little outhouse for you and so that you can do this privately. One of the things that we that I that I think is always very important to have is some kind of illumination. We often we recommend headlamps. They work well. The only the one thing you want to remember is not to shine your headlights headlamps into other people's eyes. So you need to keep your head down so that they not look up at people. Because when you get hit with the headlight, it'll take 30 or 40 seconds for you to get your night vision back. So. I often like to use a headlamp, get a headlamp that has a red function. This helps to reduce some of the uh, problems of shining lights in people's eyes. I actually always carry two headlamps because it is because if you find yourself hiking in the dark and sometimes I do in the morning if I'm going to go on a particularly long hike or if I'm trying to get to a top of a peak and want to get up there early to stay away from weather. I want to make sure I have light. I make sure I have extra batteries and I have two headlamps. One of the other things that I that and this is a very personal thing. There isn't a set rule as to what to bring, but to have a repair kit. It's nice to have a pocket knife. I always carry some surveyor's tape. That's that little bright orange thing that's about an inch and a half wide. It's nice to have to be able to mark trails, to be able to mark things. Um, if you if you're going to, especially when you're backpacking, if you're going to stay in a place for a while, you can mark where your tent is and other things. It's nice to have a brightly colored duct tape. There's many things it fixes, and it can also be used as a signaling device. When you're signaling and you're in distress, three of, th three of something always means someone needs help. So you can put some bright tape around a tree, put three rings around the tree. That's going to tell people that's where you are and that you need help. And you want to have extra batteries for any electronics you bring with you or a charging stick for your, if you're going to use like an electronic, uh, an app on your phone as your navigation, you want to have a charging stick so that you can make sure that you have power for your phone. In the event you do end up spending the night, <coughs> excuse me, it's important to have a couple things. Um, a bivy sack, it's just a simple lightweight overnight sack, um, a space blanket. I like to have some paracord just to tie things around, some tent stakes. This is um, where you would take um, the wilderness survival class. It was an enjoyable class, but a cold night. You end up spending the night in a, in a shelter that you built. And with that, I will say thank you for your time and enjoy the outdoors. Thank you so much, Mike. Thank you. I hope that was helpful. Definitely. Um, and quickly, I'm just going to dive into a little bit about COVID protocols. Um, some people had a couple, um, I know a lot of people have been wondering kind of what to do in this time of pandemic. Um, so give me one second to share a photo. Mm -hmm. Can everyone see that okay? Um, 
So the biggest things, um, we created a protocol for our trip leaders and participants um, for specific CMC outings, but I think it can apply to all recreators. Um, so one of which, um, so I just kind of wanted to go through it and highlight for you guys kind of what the important stuff um, we wanted to highlight for our uh, purposes. The first of which is um, that you should be wearing a mask at all times. Um, and I've spoken to health professionals. Um, I've looked at a tons of different protocol. And this is really the way you can make the biggest difference. Um, I know we're all kind of sick of hearing it. Um, we're kind of just, I don't know, there was a funny meme about how like the pandemic has become um, a little bit hard. Uh, I think we're all like itching to get outside. We're itching to get back to normal. But the biggest thing you can do to make a difference right now is to wear that mask and especially outside. Um, there's a lot of us recreating right now. Um, and so doing that will make a huge difference. Um, and I think that's the biggest thing people are are still yearning for. They, they want to make a difference. So um, being able to wear a mask, that is super important. Um, social distancing is the other one. And I think that's on here as well. Um, so making sure you're maintaining that space in between people when you're outside. Um, in CMC outings, we're requiring it for all participants to maintain that distance. Um, and so that's another way you can really make a huge difference while you're out, outside and recreating. Um, one little tip, because um, we are a conservation organization, is when you do step off um, on the side of the trail, making sure that you're not continuing to walk because you will damage um, and start to braid the trail uh, that way. So making sure that you're just stepping off and waiting and kind of waiting our turn. Um, practice your mindfulness, do what you need to do, but making sure that you're um, not continuing along the trail, you know, to beat any Strava records or anything like that. So um, the other big thing. Yeah. Maddie, would you mind if I added a couple things to that? Yeah. When you step off the trail, stepping on rocks, not on plants, um, step on exactly. things that are that you won't damage the natural area. And the thing I always see on the trail when people are wearing masks, a lot of us are taking it down when we're not seeing people and putting up as we come to people. But the danger is the cloud behind them, not because there isn't a cloud in front of them. So put the mask up as you come to people, but leave it on until you've gotten by for a while. Exactly. And that's a very good point. We all know it's really hot right now, so it's OK to take it off if no one's around. Um, like I'm wearing one right now, um, but making sure that you're putting it on as you're approaching people, um, it's really going to do the biggest difference um, and kind of we're just um, making the biggest difference in terms of that. And make sure you leave it on to your oh, buy them away because it's the cloud behind it that you got to worry about. For sure. As exactly. they're traveling down the trail. Exactly. Um, the other thing I wanted to highlight was see a tr crowded trailhead turn around. Um, for example, I don't know if any of you know Mount Galbraith, very popular trailhead in Golden. Um, it's pretty close to Denver. It takes like 25 minutes to get there. I saw a line of cars for about a mile um, because the trailhead was full. Um, I think it was over Memorial Day weekend and it was it was bananas, uh, needless to say. But if you see a crowded trailhead, we've got tons of awesome trails around Colorado. And I know it's not always the best to have to change your plans, but maybe pick the less crowded trailhead or try to go at an inopportune time. Like um, sunrise hikes are pretty awesome, uh, very underrated. Uh, you do have to get up, but they are really fun. So that's kind of been our guiding principle is just trying to pick those trailheads that aren't as busy. And then if you see a crowded trailhead, turn around and pick plan B. The other thing I wanted to highlight was know your risk tolerance. Um, we're seeing more and more people uh, take on kind of these more challenging activities in the outdoors. But, you know, know your risk tolerance. We don't want to overload saw, uh, Colorado Search and Rescue or our frontline workers. So being able to know kind of where that lies um, and kind of check in with yourself. Um, I'm constantly doing it. And I think it's it's good anyhow to check in and see how you're doing and what what you feel your tolerance should be for recreating outside. Um, the other thing I wanted to highlight in here is our uh, eight people or less. We're still sticking by that number. So in terms of just general recreators, making sure you're going in small groups, you know, you're not 
picking everyone from your graduating class and going on a huge outing, um, making sure you're kind of sticking to smaller, smaller groups. And it will also help with uh, trail maintenance and just general impact um, that we are seeing since more and more people are deciding to get outside um, than ever before. Two more things. Um, one um, that's on this graphic is the no carpooling. Uh, as CMC, we actually don't really have any jurisdiction over carpooling, but we are recommending that you don't do it. Um, so for you guys, if you do decide to go out and recreate, you know, drive your own cars or um, find that trailhead that has extra spots. So kind of um, just personal recreating, I we're suggesting that it's not, it is a really easy way to transfer germs. Um, and then the last thing um, that I wanted to highlight, because I think it's come up a lot, is be compassionate. I think right now everyone's really, we're all pent up. We're all dealing with the same thing. We're all sick of it. And I think sometimes it kind of leaves room for some not unnecessary aggression on the trail. And so just being compassionate, you know, if you see someone and they don't have a mask on or you see someone and they're not doing the distance, uh, just be compassionate. We're all, we're all in this together. And so instead of um, ripping someone apart for, not following the rules, trying to educate and just be be kind to each other because we're we are all in this together. So that was something I wanted to highlight because I know a lot of my trip leaders at the CMC have been witnessing kind of some aggression. So those are kind of the high hitters. Um, I know that was a very <laughs> condensed version of it, but if you guys have any questions about recreating during the pandemic, um, I'm happy to talk through some of those issues because I know it's it's been it's been tough at times to navigate especially for myself so cool and I also put um the pdf link to the graphic that Maddie was sharing so if you couldn't see it or whatever I put that in the chat um, box so if you want to take a look at that just keep it for your records or share it with your friends and family and whatnot um feel free to grab that it's on our website too but anyways there you go um, does anybody have any questions for either Mike, myself, or Maddie um, about anything that you've learned tonight or about something completely not about tonight? We can probably try to wing that too. Yeah. <laughs> cool. I have one actually. So you, you mentioned um, you're limiting trips to eight people max. Are there any activities or trip types that are still just not permitted regardless of sort of the number of people or that you're kind of still holding off on? Yeah, that's a great question, Jesse. So CMC in, in particular, um, for our June protocol, we're kind of doing it month by month to reassess, but for June protocol, we kind of wanted people to limit their activities to lower risk. So we had A through B hikes were totally okay. Easy to moderate road and mountain biking trips were okay. Um, as well as, I'm blanking here, um, but then I can, t I can speak to the ones that weren't really okay. So like any backcountry skiing, any travel to small mountain towns, um, any rock climbing, anything that requires a bit more risk, we were saying um, that we're, we're restricting those activities. I can tell you guys that in July, we're definitely gonna be adjusting that um, to include climbing um, as a permissible activity. Ooh. So yay, um, very exciting because we will hopefully launch some classes in terms of climbing. And mm -hmm. then we're also going to be allowing overnights um, in July. So again, all other protocols apply. So you're not allowed to share gear. You need to make sure that you practice hand hygiene, wear the mask, um, but we will be allowing those outings as well. Um, and then any A through D hikes, so basically the whole span of hikes will be permissible as well. So um, those 14er climbs you've been itching to do, those 13ers, um, we will be doing those starting July. Um, and for those of you that don't know what Maddie's talking about with the A through D ranking, okay. it's based on um, length and elevation gain is what it is, basically. So how high you're going, like, you know, if you're going 4,000 feet and two miles, like you're basically rock climbing anyways. But like, you know, it's, it's a kind of... Um, list of what you're what you're looking at and also adds pace in there too and so with any cmc trip going out that'll usually have a ranking of what that hike or what that outing is and it'll tell you what pace you're expected or what they're kind of expecting to go um and so it just helps you kind of plan for yourself but i'll put a link in the chat box for that as well just so you know what maddie's talking about when we say a through d so totally no thank you for that 
Um, cool. Does that answer your question, Jesse? Yeah, thank you. That was okay. yeah. great. Any other questions? So yeah, not, not sure if we have any other questions, but definitely want to thank uh, Maddie, Brittany, and Mike for uh, putting this together for NREL and uh, offering this benefit for uh, you know CMC members and otherwise. Uh, it's is the first of hopefully multiple events mm -hmm. that we're going to host, and so be on the lookout um, for additional information coming out. We have some other ideas, so definitely have some things in the work, but. Wanted to thank you guys. It's it's really awesome for you guys to take your time and do this for us and uh, give okay. us an opportunity to learn something new and ask questions and uh, kind of be a part of the CMC. So uh, reminder: if you missed the beginning of the meeting, uh, NREL has uh, discounts to join uh, CMC if you if you aren't already a member. And CMC offers a multitude of discounts uh, for being a member. Um, good at, uh, if you're you know into the outdoors and, and doing stuff climbing and otherwise. So uh yeah thanks guys we really appreciate it it was awesome and i uh, can't wait for the next one yeah and if you guys have questions after the fact so i mean sometimes you don't have questions that come up now but if you do just send us an email and we're happy to answer those questions or get you in touch with somebody that can that has more expertise in it than we do so um yeah that this line of communication is wide open so feel free to ask whenever yeah, we appreciate that. And uh, also a huge thanks to Dylan, as always, for always coordinating mm -hmm. everything to get to experience. So uh, she's awesome and everybody deserves her. Uh, she deserves all your thanks. So uh, yeah, she does. So. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. And I was going to say, if anyone wants to learn anything in particular, um, feel free to shoot me an email and then I'll work with Brittany and Maddie and see if we can pull something off. Um, so if there's something you've been itching to learn or something you haven't had the opportunity to learn yet, but would love to, um, just let me know and then we'll try to figure out how we could potentially incorporate that and try to try to get it into one of these pints and peaks. So yeah. um, always feel free to reach out as well. Yeah, for sure. And like I like I grew up and I when Dylan and I started talking about this, I grew up in Colorado. I grew up backpacking in Colorado. I still took the course that Mike teaches, Wilderness Trekking School, learned so much. I took backpacking school with Mike. Actually, we were both in the, in that course together. Um, I took our intro and intermediate climbing courses. So it's a really great way to just meet other people and, and find people that go outside and have the same respect for nature that you do too. So um, that's my plug for learning. It's, it's kind of fun to go back to school again. So um, anyways, yeah, looking forward to hanging out and actually meeting you all in person sometime soon, um, hopefully sooner rather than later. So. Absolutely. Well, thanks everybody. We appreciate you guys coming out and uh, thanks to the CMC crew for putting this on. Oh, uh, thank and, you uh, guys. Everybody. Hey guys. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Have a great thanks, day. Guys. Have a good one. Thanks. Awesome job, Mike. Did Maddie leave? Maddie, are you still on here? No, not on here. Cool. Mike, can you hear me? Because <laughs> I can't hear you. You might be on mute, actually, Mike. Hang on. <laughs> oh, yeah, you are on mute. Oh, gosh. Okay, I'm just going to...